today we are going to have Anne Schoenstein. She is working with AVID as well as with the Women's Working Group for Financing for Development. Everybody will have the chance to introduce themselves once again so you can know a little bit more personally from them. And then I'm sitting here with Annalena Bremer and she works with the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development within the special initiative One World No Hunger. And finally, we have Asa Trokinson. Asa works with UN Women, and she is an economic empowerment advisor sitting in Nairobi. So Asa, I'm going to pass to you to speak on why is this conversation on financing and economic empowerment scenarios for women relevant? Why should we even be talking about it? Is there something special about the timing? Please let us know. You're working on this day in, day out before we go into the three presentations. Thank you for handing me this word. Of course, unfortunately, the, the topic is still uh, of relevance. It has been relevant for a very long time. Um, and still, we, don't, uh, we haven't seen uh, satisfactory progress uh, of uh, the integration of gender in the agricultural sector. Um, the positive news are, of course, the abundant evidence uh, as to why it matters, namely, that we now have uh, uh, undisputable evidence on the link between uh, gender integration in agriculture and agricultural productivity and uh, food security impacts and, in general, a more uh, rapid poverty uh, reduction rate. Uh, and I wanted to just run through a little bit quickly our recent study, which we undertook with the uh, World Bank and UNEP, UNDP, Poverty Environment Initiative, UN Women, launched uh, last week, uh, or not, 15 October, at the FAO Committee on Food Security, which is actually documenting the gender gap uh, in 2011 um, for a number of countries. But we really started to look at what does it cost to countries to uh, persist to have these gender gaps, right? Um, so I think one of the, of, to make a very brief overview, some of the very sticky areas which are still remaining, apart from access to inputs, apart from access to um, financial services, information advice, uh, um, the two big sticky areas and the two bottlenecks continue to be, uh, uh, unfortunately, on access to land, which we have uh, now seen uh, robustly and which again is very linked to um, the access to the other productive inputs, um, uh, unfortunately, plus to, to the ability to participate in decision making. And the other one super sticky area is the distribution of unpaid work as we see it in households, and particularly in rural households. And there is some mounting evidence on, on the need to redress this. And our study on the cost of the gender gap actually found that the lack of accessible labor is one key constraint. So we think uh, that the solutions will be most probably around really finding some or matching in technological innovations with women's abilities to access these to really more productively engage in, in the agricultural sector. I think we are the two, three minutes, so I hand over to you. Thank you for, for really rounding up what is the issue and um, what you and women have, have done to, to sort of draw what the problems are at the moment and what needs to be improved on, on right now in those specific areas. To have a conversation on gender means that we also need to say, okay, we're talking about gender, but the commitment to financing the programs and the projects are, are not very robust. And the first thing is, a, is an introduction to Anna Schoenstein. She's working with the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. Thanks very much, Katie, and the platform for inviting um, AWID and the Women's Working Group. Um, I was asked to contribute an overarching input to the conversation today about the outcome of the FFD3 um, conference and its adequacy from a feminist lens. Um, I, I'd like to start with introducing um, briefly the Women's Working Group. The Women's Working Group on Financing for Development was formed in October 2007. 
as an alliance of women's organizations and networks who advocate for the advancement of gender equality, women's empowerment, and human rights in the financing for development related UN processes. And the group reactivated itself um, and we actively engaged in the preparatory process that led to the Addis Ababa action agenda this July. And this included uh, really the examination as well of the draft of the outcome document uh, to which we developed proposals and concrete suggested language. As the women's working group, we work closely together with and are part of also the broader civil society SSD group. The outcome of Addis, the quadruple A. <laughs> In short, for civil society, this final outcome is really disappointing and concerning. It missed the number of opportunities and it failed to create the conditions to achieve just economies, but then in turn will contribute to achieve the respect, protection, and fulfillment of human rights and including important women's rights. It fails really to remove the global obstacles to development, to address the systemic issues, overcome structural injustices, and the unequal balance of power in the current global economic governance, finance systems, and institutions. And as you, I think many in this call know, I mean, the majority of women really bear the burden of this reality and also act as shock observers and stabilizers for market and state failures. And this really adds further onto the multiple constraints that the majority of women experience, including, of course, rural women and women smallholder farmers. So, yes, the, the outcome document does include various references to women, gender, equality, human rights, and the Women's Working Group acknowledges certain parts and recognizes that, that there are already agreed language which got confirmed. For example, uh, paragraph 240 um, of the future we want that states, and I quote here, we resolve to undertake legislation and administrative reforms to give women equal rights with men to economic resources, including access to ownership and control over land, and other forms of property, credit, inheritance, natural resources, and appropriate new technology. That was incorporated into the outcome document of access. But even if I quote that, there are some points of critique around that paragraph and also further steps that are needed in this, in this uh, situation. And also, yes, <laughs> given that the process uh, towards ADIS uh, Financing for Development Conference started really quite gender silent, the explicit mentions because they're asking about it, what, uh, adequacy. I mean, this can be regarded as an achievement in a way uh, that feminist and human rights could contribute to together with other gender advocates. Um, but the picture really is more complex and, and really must look at, and, and, uh, at that and get, address it from the root and not just the surface. Um, so one of the questions that keeps coming up is like, why are feminist and women's rights organizations disappointed by this uh, outcome document, despite the fact that there are undoubtedly many more references to gender equality in women than ever before in the FSB agenda? Um, and most of you know the FSB agenda is really comprehensive. That's why it makes it also so um, uh, potentially a uh, great opportunity. So I just can give some examples now in this uh, input and um, you will know and be able to read more in the Women's Working Group reactions and, or in the further discussion. So one aspect I want to highlight is domestic resource mobilization. Tax policy really is not gender neutral, but there is no reference in the document on the need to promote equity, including gender equality as an objective in all tax and revenue policies. And also the outcome failed to establish a global UN tax body. This is something that is really needed and it needs to go beyond strengthening the existing committee of expert and international cooperation tax matters um, that doesn't fulfill the need of an intergovernmental, transparent, accountable and well resourced body that is urgently needed by all countries in order to really truly combat illicit financial flows and tax evasion and I should also add tax avoidance. And that's a situation that as basically in any area of sphere we're talking about with the agenda implication. Concerning the corporate sector and development, the FSC3 conference would have addressed the duties and responsibilities of states to protect people from harm caused by the private sector and to ensure that businesses respect human rights in their activities, but instead it rather strengthens corporate power. Moreover, governments fail to acknowledge that and let alone endorse uh, the critically important process that is unfolding in the UN Human Rights, uh, human rights Council 
that is about developing an internal, uh, international legally binding instrument on transnational corporations and other business enterprises, and that is based in an international human rights framework. Also, in terms of development cooperation, developed countries did not commit to scaling up the share of ODA for achieving gender equality, women's empowerment, and women's human rights. The other key issue that I want to still highlight is that we saw there that women's gender equality quality has been presented as a business case. The outcome document really includes strong tendencies towards instrumentalization of women and to finance and gender equality and women's empowerment as a means to achieve economic growth, to increase productivity, improve economic performance. And well, these kind of references and kind of discourse is rather limiting really uh, for a task that should aim at achieving women's full human rights. So a couple of key messages um, for moving forward and some of the aspects I raised, and as I said before, there are several <laughs> more in a very comprehensive agenda. And so I don't, don't want to say that these are more important than over others. Um, so I have seven points. Um, and one is really that achieving the full realization of human rights, including women's rights, gender equality, and women's empowerment is central to a sustainable development agenda. And this must be really a focus and an end in itself. Instead of access to ownership, uh, referring to what I mentioned earlier on the, on the quote that I read out, governments should guarantee women and girls' rights to full and equal access to ownership and control over resources, including the right to inheritance and land titling. So this is what we have. It must go further. As I said, there are more steps needed, really. Um, also, third, Ensure an enabling and safe environment for all civil society organizations, including women and rights defenders. This, and this should be translated to substantive participation at local, national, and international levels and at all stages of the development process, so planning, implementing, monitoring, and evaluation. I mean, this is particularly relevant also for setting of gender sensitive agricultural policies and really needs to come with corresponding budgeting. Related to that, I mean, all is anyway intelligent, it's just all going hand in hand. Tackling corporate illicit financial flows and tax evasion, this will contribute strongly to domestic resource mobilization that is urgently needed. And the establishment of a global tax body under the UN can be key in this regard too. Scale up the share of OEA for student gender equality and women's empowerment. And also, Yes, it's important in our view to engage constructively with and support the work of the Human Rights Council Intergovernmental Working Group that is mandated to elaborate an international but legally binding instrument uh, to, to regulate activities of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. And there it's important also to contribute ensuring that this gets done and established with an integrated gender and feminist perspective. And finally, it's important, um, also looking at uh, the focus of the platform and, and, and this call, that, that the FSB agenda is really more than the means of implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. Tackling the systemic issues, and some of them I have raised, and then there are more, like trade and um, the international financial institutions, that all the points that didn't go into detail now, is a precondition to achieve the SDGs, but also to generate the structural conditions for the implementation of the other existing international agreed development agenda and goals, such as those in the Setting Platform for Action or CEDA, or just to name two. And it does also be really, really important that um, during the that the annual ECOSIC Forum on FSC to follow up provides sufficient room for the entire FSC agenda to, to move forward and advance on the on the steps needed. Um, uh, thank you once again. I want to stop here for this initial input, and I look forward to conversation in the rest of the call. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, a lot of things to think about from what you've said. I'm sitting here with Annalena Bremer. I think you can see her on the webcam from BMZ, and she she will respond to some of the things that you've talked about and also offer a bit more information on what BMZ has been up to in not only reaction, but um, in their own mandate uh, towards this cause. Uh, allow me to just briefly introduce myself. My name is Annalena Bremer. I am a policy advisor in the ministry, in the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany. Um, and I am part of the special unit called One World No 
hunger, which is um, the agricultural division and rural development division of BMZ, our ministry. Um, and I'm responsible for um, gender in agriculture in our development cooperation, but this is only one of my responsibilities among um, a few others. So I am not a gender expert um, and it's not my, my everyday uh, business, but um, uh, even more so I find this opportunity um, very useful to uh, exchange a little bit on our perspectives um, to what extent has gender been reflected um, in the quadruple A and especially also which um, what is the relevance for the agriculture and rural development sector and I think this will be very interesting for um, us as donors to interact and also to exchange views with um, civil society. Um, so I think my first reaction would be um, that um, maybe the um, uh, the reflection of gender or um, the gaps that are still there in terms of the reflection of gender in um, the agenda um, has maybe not been perceived to this extent within uh, my ministry. Um, there are, I mean, some, there is some progress if we compare um, the, the outcome document to what has been there before. I think we always have to um, um, be uh, aware of uh, where we're coming from and in terms of what was there in Doha, um, this is definitely some progress and also as Anne has summarized, um, some progress has been made and in terms of the mentioning of gender and the explicit mentioning of gender, um, also uh, in view of access um, to resources and that has a bearing on access to resources in the agricultural sector um, is definitely an area of progress and an area that uh, the German government definitely wants to highlight that access to agricultural inputs, financial services, uh, insurance, advice, and especially access to land uh, and decision making, economic participation is crucial. Um, this is uh, definitely one area that uh, we see has improved, but still there's more room for improvement there. Um, within our BMZ gender policy of 2014, um, we see um, the need for gender balance development finance, and this is highlighted that not only domestic resources are mobilized in terms of gender responsive budgeting, but also international resources um, have to increase, especially um, Bilateral ODA um, has to increase from about 20% or so to, um, to much more that um, should, uh, should be targeted to um, these needs. Um, and we need a more systematic approach and more policy coherence also in terms of our multilateral uh, cooperation. And this is where also our cooperation with UN Women comes in and um, the fact that we need more transparent, more predictable funding um, and also um, maybe even with um, yeah, the safeguards in mind that uh, yeah, we, we need to uh, reduce the funding gap, especially in agriculture. Um, so the plan for transformative financing for gender equality and women's empowerment is something that Germany wants to support with UN Women and OECD. And definitely we see the need for um, gender desegregated data for more data and um, this is also where um, I, I'm very interested in the study that uh, Arthur mentioned earlier uh, that unfortunately I, I hadn't been aware of before um, on uh, productivity and um, the evidence that is needed also for improved advocacy within our respective donor organizations. Um, in terms of um, BMZ and, and plans, um, in terms of gender in agriculture and rural development, I think we are still following uh, a two, um, um, yeah, a double approach actually of mainstreaming um, gender still in our capacity building measures, especially in our green innovation centers, in our programs to increase the access to land, to make sure that at least 30, if not 50 percent um, of our beneficiaries are women, but then also we have specially focused programs on food security and nutrition for women and um, under the G7, um, the Skills Initiative, we are planning a new um, gender and agriculture training program uh, in the realm of CADEP in seven countries to have agricultural training institutes um, adapt their curricula and um, 
uh, improve uh, training and have exclusive training for women also in terms of um, those value chains that hold um, a lot of potential for women uh, economic empowerment. So th this is just a brief overview of what our plans are in terms of gender and uh, I would be very happy to exchange more. Thank you, Judy. Without um, coming in after that, I will actually immediately invite Asa from UN Women to come in again with her reactions to both um, Anne and Annalena and um, also give us a bit more of an idea because she's working on economic empowerment uh, within UN Women day in, day out. So she has a real, really great insight. So I was requested also to summarize a bit uh, from your conversations. Um, and I think they can be summarized uh, in two narratives, and the one is uh, a bit of a challenge story, and uh, then, of course, the gloss is also half full. So on the challenge story, I think what we are hearing is that, in general, um, we are seeing a more challenging uh, environment for development financing, um, and within this particular context, uh, the agricultural sector is perhaps particularly struggling. Uh, and within the sector of agriculture itself, um, funding for uh, there is still uh, a challenge for gender equality and women's empowerment. It still has to be negotiated. Uh, it's not uh, yet uh, integral um, in all development efforts, although uh, surely a great uh, degree of progress has happened over the years. So I'm concluding from this uh, hearing or reading that uh, working on gender and agriculture actually represents a triple challenge. Um, on the positive side, of course, we have uh, the good news, uh, namely, uh, as I mentioned, the ample evidence as to uh, the need to, and I've, I've started to abandon the, the, the verb mainstreaming uh, gender into different uh, development sectors, and I prefer to use uh, the word negotiate because I think that actually that's what we are doing uh, when we try to bring in this perspective. So to negotiate uh, uh, gender uh, equality and women's empowerment in the agricultural sector, we have a lot of data at hand to prove our point, we are no longer um, tumbling in the dark uh, related to the impacts uh, of an investment and on women's empowerment to the general benefits to uh, communities, households, and now also societies. And the other good news, uh, which I'm hearing from you, Anna and Annalena, um, is uh, from Annalena the, the, the many initiatives which are sort of coming up, in my view, on the green innovation centers, and that actually the land issue, which has for long been known as one of the key bottlenecks and, and uh, things that has to be tackled, is actually seriously being debated, and uh, many are looking for ways on how to actually make a dent on uh, both legislatively, but also in terms of empowering communities to claim their land rights, because in many other contexts, as you know, uh, we may actually have uh, an equitable um, legislation then women don't, uh, are not aware of it or are not able to claim their rights. And then from Anne, I, I heard, I didn't hear you perfectly, I must admit, but I seem to hear a little bit of um, an unhappiness about how the SFT3 went. Um, I was also part of the process, and I must say that uh, as, as it evolved, uh, my, my smile grew at least larger because the recognition came in. Uh, may not be very super specific in terms of the types of uh, initiatives uh, uh, needed or strong commitment, uh, but at least it's, it may be a starting point. Um, and uh, many of the issues that are at the core of uh, uh, women's productive engagement in agriculture, such, such as access to ownership, uh, 
have actually been at least uh, uh, addressed. Um, so I don't know if you want to make some kind of feedback on my reading of these two narratives, or if you have, if we want a discussion on these complementary views, or if you want me to move straight on to some of the solutions that we are proposing. I guess over to you. Asa, you had something a little bit more to add before I open it up. We have quite a number of listeners, and I'm sure they they might have some questions also for you. I just wanted to reach out to mm -hmm. Anne because uh, we all said that we heard her. We wish we could have heard a bit better. Anne, do you have anything to comment back to Asa and Annalena? Thank you very much, Katie. Um, I'll be very brief because I think it indeed um, it will be great to hear from the other participants and then have the diversity in the in the in this call as well of different voices. Um, um, I think that what I heard, and as I said before, I have a little bit of challenge with the line. I hear also that um, it will be important that we actually have these exchanges. Know that there is an awareness among different actors um, of different positionings and proposals and solutions. Um, so I think that um, what I hear was from Annalena um, mentioned at the beginning is that let's have such dialogues um, which are important to learn from each other. And it would be great also to hear from Asa on the, the solutions and, and, um, and ideas that, that you had in mind and, and for proposals. Generally, because I, I, mm. I, if I got you right, Asa, you, I didn't come across quite clearly um, through the line in my initial input, but I'd like to stress is really that for the civil society organizations and women's groups, feminist groups in particular, the outcome is a disappointing one because it, it, it failed the chance. It, the FSC agenda really has a chance to um, to tackle the, the structural issues and to you know to overcome the global um, obstacles that hinder mm. development and uh, and that's really why there's such a big disappointment. And even though we do have some references and many more. Than, than in the past on this agenda. We cannot overlook um, what, is, what the overall picture tells us, and that could make things even worse, <laughs> looking at some of the developments that we have also in terms of the private sector engagement and so on. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think this is uh, great, and uh, the other story which is coming out is that in view of these uh, challenges that we are facing in terms of the shrinking funding situation, um, they really need to work together um, and be aligned in, in what we do, and we know that our resources for gender is uh, a little bit limited, so be very strategic in how we invest uh, them and be very strategic in how we communicate with one another. And this is uh, where I want to also congratulate you for bringing us together. It's always a nightmare to, to coordinate, and we don't hear ourselves perfectly, but we do hear one another uh, at least um, uh, at the central point level. And I think this is great, and it's something that we should be continue to doing and keep on checking with, with one another where, where we are going uh, so that really our energies are harvested and, and resources in the most productive direction possible so that they can be invested to make the most possible change. Um, so I wanted to then move to some of the solutions we are proposing, and I've been a reviewer to the challenge funds, uh, one of these innovation funds, uh, they called me in to bring a gender lens to uh, these awards. And I'm sure, uh, of course, Germany are very familiar with this uh, modality. It was not one of yours, but, uh, but nevertheless. And, and what uh, they have been looking for is always you know, game-changing innovations. Um, that can change, uh, very few things can actually uh, change maybe overnight or in a very short time radically uh, the current situation. Um, um, for example, uh, mobile money, perhaps in Kenya, has done that, and even to women, broken down the isolation, making it much more easy to, to transfer uh, money and to enter the market. But leaving that aside, I have been reflecting a lot about the game changers, namely the uh, cheap innovations uh, that we can engage in that can radically improve women's lives. And I think we haven't um, uh, enough 
view the policy changes as these kind of a game changers, but they can be. Um, so, and a lot of the work we do, patients lead <laughs> with a lot of you know, consistent emphasis is actually to bring about uh, the changes needed at the, the enabling uh, level. Um, but then, uh, and I think we addressed some of these areas of work where changes are really radically needed, mainly on land, and shifting the balance of unpaid work, and making, um, but, but even at a more detailed level, for example, you may know that uh, a third of all food that is produced is actually wasted because in poor households, of uh, women headed by women because they cannot be stored and saved. So, for example, you have post-harvest bags, but then they are taxed along other commercial bags uh, at 16%, for example, in Kenya, along with cement bags, because the realization is not there that this is a food security objective. So I think, I mean, exploring some of the value chain, some of the sticky areas, and seeing, I mean, you may not change the game in terms of production uh, easily, but you can. But you can also stop losses. Uh, it's another type of innovation. So, for example, investment on improved uh, post-harvest surely is, is one of these areas where at a detailed level policy options could then be explored, for example. But then on the other hand, and as I mentioned, I think there is need to really empower communities, markets, uh, um, change and try to impact on the way that consumer preferences are heard, because uh, I think there could be quite the market for gender equitable produce. But this is a very preliminary thinking, uh, such as uh, we have explored with the private sector trying to bring them on board on women's empowerment principles, namely uh, to, to start having an integrated thinking in actually the way uh, business is done, uh, we believe that taken together this could maybe change the rules of uh, the game. Um, other, of course, areas of work is uh, capacity building because there's one thing, of course, to have an uh, enabling condition and uh, then another to equip those who are actually targeted and tasked to transfer these uh, these norms uh, to the benefit of the people and to be able to do that. And I was really happy and will be super pleased to learn more about your initiative on the training centers, uh, which was, uh, you know, I heard very little, but if we have time, I would love to hear more, both on the green innovation centers and the, and the training ones, and also uh, Germany on, uh, on uh, your initiative and support to CADEP, um, which is of course, another of our counterparts. Uh, another thing which we can do and that an um, implementation solution that we are working on is uh, uh, we are very preoccupied with this enigma of there being so many great ideas and actually small technological solutions which could radically improve women's lives and then having the knowledge about uh, what women actually would need in terms of solutions and that there is not a market where these uh, technologies can uh, reach women, actually. And we had a Rockefeller Center Bellagio meeting in March uh, gathering a broad array of stakeholders from investors, financial sector providers, data generators, different UN um, partners, research organizations to CSO, civil society organizations, to look at this enigma like from our different standpoints and ask ourselves really hard questions as what, what, what do we need to do? I mean, what is really missing? This is where we found out that this, for example, the bag was taxed so highly. I just mentioned that I opened up for some questions and um, I gave the first question to Adelina just to comment on what Anne had mentioned earlier that there seems to be a shift towards a, a discussion that almost instrumentalizes women's role. Um, we're talking about economically empowering women and financing uh, women's uh, development, but because it makes economic sense and it leads to economic growth, and this sort of business case, she, she felt, or should I say the women's working group uh, felt, might have been more powerful or overpowering than the human rights 
um, perspective. What is your reflection on that, and, and do you think there needs to be more of a balance? Does it have any impact on outcomes in the end? I think um, it, is, it is an interesting perspective that um, we hadn't seen uh, in our analysis of the outcome document. Um, we had actually um, seen human rights and gender as uh, one area where there is always explicit and joint mentioning of the two. So um, it falls within our approach of looking at gender in terms of a rights-based approach and uh, in the light of human rights and not just the economic empowerment of women for the economic benefit or for economic growth. Um, but I find uh, the perspective very interesting and um, um, just for the fact that we haven't read it that way. It's also about wording, I guess, that maybe we haven't been um, sensitive there. Um, but uh, I think both both are very important. But um, yeah, one is not just the means for the other. It is. Yeah. It is. Um, I think both perspectives need to be uh, integrated. In fact, I'm, I'm very happy to share more information also after our teleconference. Um, definitely yeah. on our green innovation centers that um, our minister has initiated in 13 countries, 12 um, in Africa and India, where in green innovation centers, um, actually it is um, a, a network usually and also a training center that comes together where uh, smallholder farmers, local research institutes, international research institutes, and also private sector come together and share innovation, um, where a lot of training happens and value chains Sometimes uh, there are one or two or sometimes three or four value chains that um, uh, training and exchange of innovation um, happens on. Um, and then in addition, we support the training centers that um, CADEP, um, in, the, uh, in, in our support to CADEP, we also support the training centers in six countries at the moment. And actually, we are currently planning um, a special program targeted uh, at women and training for women um, in these training centers. And I'd be very happy um, to receive input um, from you to, um, to better plan this program, which curricula, which um, value chains we should target, and also um, where is most economic potential. And then now to have the link to the question, is it only about economic um, in economic empowerment, or also where, where are the human rights in this debate? Um, in our analysis of the outcome document um, of Addis Abeba, we had looked at gender um, solely from the human rights perspective, or actually we hadn't um, interpreted it that way um, as maybe the Women's Working Group had done it, that um, women are instrumentalized um, in the narrative, uh, which I find is an interesting perspective that we should be mindful of. Thank you so much for all the presentations and the discussions, and I think it's been very interesting. If that is all, I will say goodbye, thank you once again, and uh, yes, yeah, thank you for joining.